guys, I'm going to ask y'all just to go ahead and come on up, make your way up here. It's, they're making their way up here. Let me explain to you what we're going to do this morning. This is a history session. Uh, as I was walking out last night, going back to my room, I passed by a, a big picture there of Billy Graham preaching in Madakana, uh, the world's largest stadium. In 1999, I preached there, and it was the most intimidating experience of preaching in my life. And the week before I was to preach, I was down on a lonely beach, and I felt, Sammy, you are so stupid. What in the world are you trying to do? You have this little ministry. I've been asked by the evangelical Christians. We did not have an organization like Dr. Graham. And what are you doing? And I sent an email out to my friends and said, pray for me. I feel so, so inadequate, so stupid doing this thing. And um, one of my friends sent me an email back, and it said this, Sammy, you go forward by looking back. Remember what God has done for you in the past. He has not changed. Amen. And uh, I've never forgotten that little email. I've kept that with me. You go forward by remembering what God has done in the past. I, I am convinced that if we're to go forward in America, we have got to look back and remember what God has done in this country. I don't think that you can understand, I, I, I have this deep conviction, you cannot understand American history unless you understand the great awakenings. And I don't, if, if I were a non-Christian, I would say that. You cannot understand evangelical Christianity unless you understand what happened in this country historically and spiritually. So one of the purposes that we want to have for this session is to help us all understand what God has done in the past, so look back, see what he's done in the past so that we can move forward. The second thing that we want to do in this session, and my prayer is that there will be a thirst created, as, as Brother Roberts talked about a thirst, a thirst thirst created. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he did yesterday, he can do today. And so a thirst for God to do it again. And uh, the reason I'm not on the panel is because I'm I, I got to shut up. I'm, this is not a preaching panel here. This is a, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop and get out of the way here. But I, I just wanted to set the stage for that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start. We have four distinguished gentlemen here who all have done great study in the areas that they're going to be sharing. And we're going to ask Bob Bakke to share first on the first and uh, second great awakenings. We get, we've given him two uh, assignments in one. But Bob, before you start sharing about that, tell us just a, uh, briefly, in maybe three sentences, how, how did your burden for revival and you get involved in, in this whole revival message? How did that start? Just, just introduce yourself to that message to the people. Uh, I think my, my um, interest grew. Um, well, I'm, I mean, it's like listening to Francois. Uh, when, when you hear the stories of how God has moved in the past, your, your spirit is just moved and, and the hunger grows to say, God, God do that in my life. God, tell me, how, how in the world does this, does this happen? Um, I remember reading a letter from an Englishman to an American during the height of one of the revivals, and he says, well, while we fish with poles, you fish with nets. Um, what a wonderful picture. Here, the, the paucity of one fish at a time and standing for hours beside the water waiting for some fruit to come while you there are pulling in the nets and how, do, how does this happen? And the hunger grows in one's heart to say, um, please God, do this in, in my life and do this in our generation. For we're all supposed to be jealous for our own generation and for the glory of Christ therein. So I think that that's how it started. The you, we, we've given you the assignment of the, the first two awakenings, and, and really, before this country was formed officially and formally, mm -hmm. we were birthed in a spiritual move of God. Tell us about that. Start there and, 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 and with that. 
Yeah, actually, I have, I have an impossible task um, to, <laughs> to talk about these two great moves of God in such a short time. But I, I think we have to go back even further than the, um, the 18th century uh, to understand how this thing all, took, all these things took place. And in fact, it affects, the, um, affects 200 years of revival history in America. Let me take you back into the 17th century, 1600s. Uh, there were, in, in England, after the Reformation and, and the effects of, of um, Protestants coming to, to um, full and undeniable sway in, uh, on the British Isles, uh, at least uh, in England and Scotland, uh, there did grow a coldness in the hearts of Christians in the state churches of of England and uh, particularly Lutheran German Europe. And there grew within that, that, those state churches a hunger for God to do a brand new thing. And there was, a, there was within it then the establishment of what is called prayer societies. Um, they were not allowed to be formed as either Bible studies or, or teaching opportunities for laymen. They were the societies born to raise up prayer for renewal in the church. At first, these prayer societies were resisted by the state churches because the, the state churches didn't want uh, people with, within them praying for new works of God. And in fact, they were actually resisted quite vigorously in certain parts. This, the hunger for a new work of God within the state churches of Europe uh, found th uh, their most easy home among the pietists who were arising, pietists who were hungering for that revelation, that Ephesians letter of the heart for Jesus and the knowledge of, of Christ intimately, an experiential religion, not just simply one of orthodoxy, but one of heartfelt longing and personal interaction with the loving and personal God. These pietists um, uh, grew to be significantly, um, well, it's sort of like what happened in America and in, in most of the world with regard to the rise of Pentecostalism and, and the charismatic uh, phenomena in the, from the Azusa Street revival on and how that movement has so in, affected us, pietism, had that kind of effect upon the churches of its day. It brought in a whole new kind of w a way of looking at, for God and at God and interaction with God. Until by the end of the 1600s, uh, 1700s, a man by the name of Jakob Spener, in his famous book, Pia Desideria, Pious Desires, codified within the church a way of thinking with regard to evangelical faith. And in this Pia Desideria, he established prayer societies for the renewal of, of religion in the church as fundamental to the ongoing work of God. Um, by the end of the 1700s, then, prayer societies had infiltrated m almost every region of the church, of the of, uh, Protestant Christian Christianity. In the early 1700s, guys like Cotton Mather uh, on, in the U.S. were establishing prayer societies in the universities and the colleges. And these were people who, by, uh, by practice, would set aside time in, uh, every fortnight or so, once every two weeks, for the reading of scripture and prayer and the seeking of God for a new and fresh work of, of grace in, their mini in the ministries to which they were assigned. Uh, Mather established them, many people established them on both sides of the Atlantic. One of the most famous of these sort of um, morphed prayer society deals was uh, Jakob Spener's uh, godson, uh, Nicholas von Zinzendorf uh, and his Moravians in Saxony where he gathered these Moravians to himself on his estate and over the course of months and infighting that was terrible 
uh, came finally to an agreement within these societies with regard to how they should operate and seek the face of God. This uh, unitas fratrum, this unity of the brotherhood, in prayer, in the seeking after God for a new work of grace, uh, brought a revival of the Moravians, a powerful work of God, which then launched a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, prayer ministry uh, among the Moravians that lasted a hundred years. A hundred years. And in the course of this revival of a work of grace, uh, 1727 uh, was its celebration. There was, in fact, a, a launching of a brand new kind of missionary movement throughout the earth. And these Moravians just started going everywhere, sort of like, um, well, like, it was sort of viral. They just, they just went everywhere, creating this disease uh, called the hunger for God. And in fact, John Wesley, on his pilgrimage to the U.S. for the first time, was in a great storm and met some of these Moravians who were not afraid of death, praying on the decks of the ships while the, while the ship was going back and forth and no one was, was confident they were, they were going to survive it. And these Moravians were joyfully singing on the decks and praising God. Well, in 1727, too, in the U.S., in New England, there was a violent earthquake in New England. And a, a revival took place in 1727, corresponding to the spiritual earthquake that was taking place in Europe. And this softening up of the Church of, of Christ in New England by natural phenomenon, uh, there was a great in, inbreaking of, of the Holy Spirit in this, and many were saved. The preaching was filled with, this, with the uh, allusions to the this great earthquake in New England for many, many years thereafter. So now we're into the 1720s. People are praying. The prayer societies are everywhere. They're seeking after the face of God. There's natural phenomenon. There's spiritual outbreaks in Europe. Um, at the same time, these pietists had affected uh, parts of the Netherlands. And as the English uh, were persecuted, the pietists were persecuted and left England and landed in Rotterdam, they were infected by these pietists and their prayer societies. And they became praying folks as well. And part of these people left for the US, the, the more fundamentalists, the fundamentalists of them, they, they ended up in, on our soil. But others, after the persecution in England died down, brought their hunger for God in these prayer societies back to England with them. And soon after, London was filled with them. So this disease, this hunger for the work of God was spreading in Europe, in England, in the US. And God was adding to this phenomenon, um, earthquakes and the like, to stir up the church. By the 1730s then, in Northampton and the Connecticut Valley of uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut River Valley then, you have had a church that for many, many years has been seeking the face of God. And in the person of Jonathan Edwards, a revival takes place in the heart of Northampton and most, many of you are familiar with this great revival, which then sweeps down the Connecticut River Valley. It overtakes them, and well, I could just go, I could spend the next half hour just on that. The revival then, however, takes a turn. Just five years later, a new wave comes in from Europe, not, uh, not, uh, well, it's dissimilar to what had taken place in Northampton in the persons of George Whitfield and John Wesley, these superstars that came with great preaching and attracting enormous crowds. Great preaching, however, with, in, in cultivated, uh, and the earth softened in the heart of the church readied by great praying over many, many years. Uh, I've got a half hour to go, but I've only got two minutes. Um, let's fast forward. There were quiet years 
uh, in the 1760s, but not entirely quiet. There were revivals in Long Island and, and uh, New Jersey, et cetera. But let me just ask Go you, ahead. is there something that brought a slowdown? Was there anything that you can identify that caused uh, a decline in that, that movement, that revival that took place? Well, the, the, there have been many speculations with regard to why it was so, it, it, it passed so quickly. But it, let me give you a number. The, what, uh, Jonathan Edwards' church um, swelled to great numbers during the, the two waves of revival that came to his town. But by 1750, or, or just about the time he was about to leave his church, the attendance at his church was at a lower ebb than when the when the revival before than when before the revival came. So this revival came swiftly like a wave, but it also went out very quickly. So a wave up on the shore that that also declined uh, quite readily. Um, I th uh, I'm I'm convinced. Um, that it was because the relationships among pastors and leaders uh, wasn't sufficient to maintain it, which distinguishes it from the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening in 1800 and onward, let me just give you a, the nutshell. We have, this, we have now a, a, a disparate group of people having received this common phenomenon, which is called the Great Awakening. And it creates, for the first time, a sense of national identity. Uh, that did last uh, beyond the, um, the fervor of the Awakening. The Revolutionary War takes place. They, these are grim days in the US. Um, there are some bright spots with regard to the church, but by the 1790s, the American church is at an altogether historic low. Uh, after having finished eight years of grievous war with, with, um, with the British, injuries abounded, households, estates were gone, the, countries trying to recover from its grievous wounds. The nation was bankrupt. The, there was difficulty in believing that they could pay, in fact, their foreign exchange, uh, their, their foreign indebtedness. And if it wasn't for the, the heroic efforts of, of Hamilton to argue otherwise, they would have defaulted on all of their foreign responsibilities financially. Um, there were plagues in the land. There were canker worms eating crops and corn and grasses. Uh, the fruit bearing trees were going bad. There were, there were plagues, very, smallpox and, and distemper, what they called distemper, was rampant throughout the lands. Tens of thousands of people were dying, particularly in the major metropolitan areas. In fact, it was so bad in Philadelphia that they had to move the capital, which was in Philadelphia during the, the warmer months, away from the, the swampy shores of the Delaware River into Trenton, New Jersey, to get away from the disease and, and the death. Uh, there were, uh, we had two superpowers poised on our borders, both France and England, who were at a sort of constant state of undeclared war against us. And they were pirating our ships off the coast so we couldn't get goods to, to, the, to Europe. What else was bad? Uh, we had religious plagues coming in. Universalism and Unitarianism was scooping up vast tracts of religious landscape. The, the Enlightenment was coming, Voltaire and Rousseau and all the rest. In fact, Voltaire was, hated the church. He called it the wretch that needed to be expunged from history. And the place was so bad with regard to Christianity. The earth was so bad that Voltaire was confidently predicting that Christianity would not survive his lifetime. The, uh, so, and, but you had the French reign of terror going on too, where thousands were dying under the guillotine and France was a, was a despotic place and there was fears that the, that revolution would be transported into the US revolution. The, the political situation in the US was terrible. Uh, you think the infighting is bad today? You should read the editorial pages of the 1790s. It was horrendous. 
um, uh, the Christians thought that Jefferson was the prophet of the Antichrist. And I'll, I'll tell you in my workshop more about that if you're, you're interested. But the place was a wreck. And there was no confidence that America could survive this experiment. Ah, what was the response? The prayer societies. They, there were calls to prayer, small things. Get the prayers, the prayer societies out of Edwards. Get the prayer societies out of our great Puritan fathers. Uh, what, it, what God has done in the past, let's restore it again. Let's get the, the folks praying. And little by little, they began to pray. And little by little, they, they, they began to see the answers to the prayer. And in 1800, there is an explosion of grace upon the American landscape. And so great was this explosion, so profound in its moving, that it essentially persisted for 50 years and fundamentally changed the nature of America in, in the course of four years. There's my summary. Let, let, me, let me just ask one real quick question, and we, we need to move on yes. to another summary. <laughs> the, uh, uh, there, there was a great difference in the, the two revivals as far as leadership. It seems to me That's like right. the leadership was more scholarly, more intellectual in the first Great Awakening, and it was more of a pioneer. C can you just for a couple minutes tell us a little bit of the difference in, in the leadership of style in those two revivals? The, the leadership of style in the, in the first Great Awakening was, was really dominated, well, it was, it was what came out, the, the fruit of, what, the cream that came to the, the, the top was, was Edwards and, and his cohorts who saw with him um, his, his reasoning and his defense of the work of God. Uh, parallel to Edwards, however, are the, is the Whitfield and the Wesley uh, phenomenon. They're, they're, they're a bit different, but they had the same, they had similar impact upon wherever they went. What, what, what these leaders did, and this is important for the Second Great Awakening, is that these leaders, like Whitfield and Wesley, they cut trenches between previously unrelated streams that the revival filled in and they created networks of relationships that hitherto had not existed. So when these people came, swept through an area, relationships uh, persisted beyond their ministry. But within, with Edwards, the reason why the Second Great Awakening and beyond was I think more profound is the fact that Edwards thoughts on the issues actually had time to settle into the soil of the church. And for 150 years beyond the Great Awakening, it was Edward's perspective on revival and particularly on the way God works in history that became the conversation uh, of the age and dominated uh, the thought of, of the Christian church. So, Edwards was a, a brand new thing in, uh, in the First Great Awakening. It settled into the soil of the evangelical mind by the second. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. John? Uh, tell us, uh, John is pastor at, uh, Bob, you're pastor at? Bloomington Baptist Church in Minneapolis. Bloomington Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and John is pastor of First Baptist Church in West Monroe, Louisiana. Tell us uh, how you developed a heart for a revival, how you got involved in the whole revival message and, and, and so forth, just yeah. in a couple sentences, and then we'll go into uh, the awakening. Great. Uh, my heart for revival really was birthed in uh, uh, the Ph.D. work at Southwestern Seminary where uh, Dr. Roy Fish, who many of you will be aware of, um, taught us for a year uh, the spiritual awakenings, and um, you know, here I was in seminary, and I was utterly stunned that I uh, I knew nothing of this, and I knew nobody that knew anything of this, and um, uh, in a in a uh, a seminar where um, there were some uh, uh, some wonderful friends, God just broke out one day, and none of us will ever forget it, and really we formed an accountability group, a support group after that, and those guys are spread out all over the country now, the world now, like Alvin Reed, professor of evangelism, spiritual awakening at Southeastern Seminary, and 
uh, Steve Gaines, pastor of Bellevue, succeeded Adrian Rogers. All these kind of guys were in that seminar, and it, um, it, it changed us. And uh, years later, I was a, a part of a movement um, in Brownwood, Texas, that uh, has come to be called the Brown, Brownwood, different from Brownsville, Brownwood Revival, that uh, very repentance-based revival movement that, uh, where I, I saw these things with my eyes and um, changed me forever. That's, that's the short answer to how my heart for revival began. Bob talked about the prayer societies and the, uh, the first and second great awakening and the effect of prayer on this. Now, what we're asking you to talk about is what sometimes is called the great prayer revival. Right. Tell us about it. Just well, the next time you're, uh, you're praying alone and maybe a little discouraged and maybe feeling like there seems to be very little hope for uh, God to actually change your church or your city, um, think back. 150 years and realize you could be 20 minutes away from changing the world. It was 150 years ago, September 23rd of 1857, that uh, a layman named Jeremiah Lanfear, a businessman who had become a, a lay missionary in essence, um, was praying alone in a, uh, in a room in the Dutch Reformed Church on Fulton Street in New York City, uh, where I've been many, many times to that, uh, to that very place, by the way. Uh, it's, it's really now in the shadow of ground zero. Very interesting fact to know. And um, he, uh, he was praying there alone, but he didn't intend to pray alone. He'd invited uh, many people to come and, uh, and join him, but he was alone for 20 minutes. Uh, and after 20 minutes, he heard footsteps and a very small band came and joined him. And it, it must have been terribly discouraging to advertise and call for people to pray uh, and for six people to show up, you know, total. Have you ever been there, you know? <laughs> And, uh, um, but they prayed and, uh, and asked God to do, to do a work. Uh, but I, 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 they could not have even dreamed what God would do. And that's my life verse, by the way, is Ephesians 3, 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all you could ask or imagine or dream, you know. And they could not have imagined or dreamed that just a few months later, um, historians now uh, write about it. The uh, secular magazines and journals were writing about it. For instance, in the first three months, of 1858 recorded, this is just what we know about, 25,000 people came to Jesus Christ in the city of New York. And it was directly, I mean, the direct result of a man praying alone for 20 minutes and then a few others joining him. And in just a few weeks time after that, uh, that exploded into prayer meetings all across New York City. Uh, tens of thousands, no one will ever really know how many people were, were praying. Many people believe there were 50,000 people praying in the city of New York. But uh, the, the numbers are really not that important because the phenomena was, was, was so pervasive, no one could miss it. Um, it, was, it was everywhere. It was not a church-based phenomena primarily. It was a marketplace phenomena. And um, I, I've got so many quotes and don't have time to read, to read them all. I'll cover many of these in our... Uh, uh, in, in, in the, the workout, the, the, the workout, I need a workout, in the workshop. <laughs> workout, get rid of that. <laughs> if, and if, if we want to, we could, we could do a workout instead. But um, <laughs> what, one, of my, one of my favorite quotes is this. Um, uh, well, it says, a meeting for prayer was started in one of the largest printing offices in New York City. A printing office. Uh, it, it was not very long before a dozen men pro professed Christ in the printing office, and someone observed, this is a quote from, the, from that day, what are we to expect when printing offices are converted into religious chapels? This is, as far as my knowledge extends, unprecedented in the history of any country, and this happened all across um, the city, and it happened every day. Um, the churches really responded to the movement of God. Uh, it wasn't really church-based. Uh, many of, of the churches finally realized they, they better start responding to what God was doing, and began to open the churches 24-7. But initially, it was, uh, it was more in places like printing shops and businessmen that would just gather every, uh, every day to pray and to ask God to, um, to move in power. And I really want to encourage you, if you're in a struggling environment, here's really what happened. If you were looking in that day in the eyes of the flesh, you would have seen a, um, a failed church with a failed strategy and a failed prayer meeting. That's what you would have seen. Right. Because really what happened was the church was relocating where Jeremiah Lanfear began to pray. And they left him there uh, almost like an afterthought. They left him there as a missionary as they relocated. Right? And his strategy was to invite all these people to come to pray and, and all the multitudes would gather. But six showed up. Um, and, and, and so you could argue the strategy was failed. 
uh, that it was a failed church with a failed strategy and a failed prayer meeting. And yet out of that came, um, came what historians estimate to be over a million people completely unchurched in this country in the year ahead, that great year of 1858 that gave their, their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Um, and, and so, you know, if, if you get discouraged a little bit where you are, remember, or remember that. And um, the, I was going to say, this didn't just happen here from what I uh, understand. This spread on over to Northern Ireland. I think Spurgeon said during that period he had the most conversions of his ministry, uh, something like that. Uh, are you familiar or aware of any of the spread that it took beyond New York on into other areas. I think D.L. Oh, yeah. Moody was converted. Oh, yeah. And, uh, not converted. D.L. Moody was oh. in one of the prayer meetings at uh -huh. YMCA. Uh, just speak a little bit about the, the spread of it uh, to other parts of the country and yeah. to, um, to uh, the other parts of the world. Yeah, J. Evan Orr and others have written about the fact that this really became a worldwide movement. Um, and, and, and some of it some of it was related to New York and other, other parts of it in other countries. It seems like uh, it was just one of those seasons where God was moving around the world. In a uh, DVD I'll show in, in, uh, in the workshop, um, Korea. A lot of what we see happening in Korea now was actually birthed way back then. Um, but, to, of course, this spread from coast to coast. Um, and we talk about New York when we talk about 1858, but you could easily argue that Philadelphia, for instance, had just as a strong a movement of God in the city of Philadelphia. Um, but, but this was a coast-to-coast -coast movement. There's no doubt about, about it in our country and, uh, and, and spread across the, across the world. Now, you know, I've thought a lot about this movement and other movements and um, was listening to Bob, which is fascinated by what he was sharing. And you know something interesting about revival? Um, the great spiritual awakenings are very, very diverse. Very diverse. And it, it's a little difficult to find commonalities among some of these movements. Let me tell you two commonalities, though, that um, they were certainly both in the 1858 movement, but I believe these are commonalities in every movement, and one of them you'll expect, uh, and that's what I would call remnant praying. But, but let me also comfort you in this a little bit. I think one of the, one of the dangers we have in, uh, in those of us that have a heart for revival is believing that revival won't come until the masses of the people in our church are praying. I can't identify any spiritual awakening where that really preceded revival. 